In my talk, I'm going to present a bird's eye view, so to speak, of uh, neuroscience, uh, quantum mechanics, and uh, Vedic wisdom. Uh, we've looked at many different possibilities, and we've also spoken of a lot of uh, problems that confront us uh, in terms of uh, knowing a lot in certain fields and knowing too little in certain other fields in trying to uh, assemble uh, our view on what consciousness is. So, uh, first of all, uh, when we look at uh, neuroscience, uh, we do know that uh, the processing that takes place inside the brain is distributed. And um, how do we know this? Uh, because uh, there can be injury to the brain, and a person can lose the capacity to read which is alexia, without losing the capacity to write. In other words, there are specialized centers which are uh, dedicated to reading, and there are certain other centers which are dedicated to writing. And this is, of course, um, um, counterintuitive. You also can be perfectly fine as far as your vision is concerned, but still lose the capacity to recognize faces, including your own, which is prosopagnosia. Now, the whole question is, if the processing is distributed, how does the unity that we all have in our minds arise? Is it emergent, as the standard view of science uh, tells us? Or is there something much more interesting and complicated? Or is it like uh, the, uh, the story of Plato's cave, where all that we have in different academic disciplines are the various shadows, and the challenge is, can we, by examining these shadows, come to the unity which holds it all together? And, and of course, uh, it also brings us to issues uh, such as the ones which uh, uh, science um, writers and um, others uh, talk about, namely, will machines of the future be conscious? And, and if they are conscious, then what would that, where would that leave um, um, uh, you know, biological machines, or that is, uh, human beings. All right, now, uh, one way to deal with this uh, counterintuitive or paradoxical aspect of consciousness, which is what I I'm going to stress, and this idea of paradox is what I will use to connect neuroscience, quantum mechanics, and Vedic wisdom is uh, this whole question of autonomy, because uh, neuroscience tells us that there are certain counter-intuitive uh, uh, results related to autonomy. A person is uh, asked to take a conscious decision, but uh, if his uh, motor cortex, for example, is wired up, the electrical activity in the motor cortex corresponding to that region builds up several hundred milliseconds prior to this person's apprehension uh, or recognition of that decision. So do, are we, uh, do we have autonomy or not? Now, this is a problem which, uh, in a different context, has been examined by uh, people like uh, Jacques Hadamard, the mathematician from France, who, about 100 years ago, uh, wrote to the leading scientists of the time and asked them, how did you reach your creative discovery. And most of them said that this discovery was made uh, in a state of heightened awareness, or perhaps in a dream, or possibly as a kind of an epiphany. And therefore, do we just keep it, at, uh, look at it uh, in that uh, particular expressed form, or does that allow us to step back and uh, see something which is uh, not being attempted in a reductive scientific uh, system that we have uh, right now. And uh, we also have a lot of counterintuitive results uh, associated, associated with savants, which uh, people like Oliver Sacks and others have written. Now, one interesting thing uh, which brings us back to uh, the Greek philosophers, there was a debate in Greece is reality change 
or is reality things? Is the universe out there as material, materiality, or is, is it just continual change? And what's interesting is that quantum theory, the Schrodinger equation tells us that uh, change is the thing, the very last line here, uh, d phi by dt is equal to, is proportional to phi. And that, the, the fact that these are two different facets of the same reality is the very heart of quantum mechanics. It's a very interesting thing. Now, now of course, uh, quantum theory itself, uh, which uh, uh, is the deepest uh, scientific theory that we have, um, is the Schrodinger equation is deterministic, but when we interact with the system, it collapses, and therefore the question of the observer comes in. Does the collapse takes place, uh, take place because of the interaction of consciousness with matter? There are lots of philosophical tracts that have been written on it, and also the whole question of entanglement, which uh, people have seen at work in different uh, situations, including the one where we thought that this might be at the basis of what happens after death. So there are all kinds of uh, interesting uh, possibilities. Uh, now, uh, there is a theory in, um, in um, consciousness studies related to quantum mechanics which suggests that uh, the brain functioning has two layers. The higher one, or this, the, the surface one, is uh, neural, and of course, uh, we can examine that by studying uh, neural structures inside the brain. But there's a deeper one, which is quantum mechanical, and where there are these virtual particles which interact in particular, in different ways, and maybe that's what gives us access to the unconscious. And maybe this quantum mechanical uh, reality, if you will, is interconnected, and it's the same field which pervades uh, the whole world. So there are, there are many interesting theories on this. Uh, and uh, recently, in the last um, two or three years, uh, although for a long time um, there were um, scientists who said, well, it's futile to look at uh, quantum mechanics as being uh, the, uh, the principle behind the functioning of the brain because of the noise which is present in the brain. But in the last two or three years, uh, new theories which are generally being accepted of photosynthesis of avian quantum compass and sense of smell have been advanced and they are being taken very, very seriously. And therefore, the whole tide seems to be turning. Now, this brings us to Vedic wisdom. Now, uh, it so happens now, why am I talking about Vedic wisdom? I also study uh, Vedic texts and I've written on them and there's some most interesting parallels uh, between the uh, insights of modern science and and uh, Vedic wisdom, which is where sages come in. And uh, one good thing is to see what those parallels are. And the second uh, issue is, can those parallels tell us something about where we ought to be going or give us some hints as to where there could be uh, productive advancement? Uh, now, of course, uh, according to the uh, Vedic wisdom, there is a universal mind and uh, there is a transcendental unity, but uh, this uh, transcendental unity uh, gets embodied in terms of all the diversity that we see uh, in the universe. Uh, now, uh, there, there's an interesting uh, idea which is discussed in the Vedic text, which is that there are two kinds of sciences. And one of them is called apara, or the lower science. And apara is supposed to be the science of all objects uh, and associations between these objects, which is what ordinary science is. You're doing physics or chemistry, or you're doing biology, or you're doing neuroscience. We can study each of these objects, and we can see those relationships. Now, what the Vedic texts say that in addition, there's got to be some, another field of inquiry related to the experiencing self. And this experiencing self can only look outside, can look at objects. So all of our ordinary standard sciences are objective sciences. But the science of the experiencing self, since the self cannot 
turn its gaze on itself will forever be outside of the domain of the lower or standard sciences. And therefore, according to this view, which is the Vedic view, the science of consciousness will never be like an ordinary science uh, that we uh, read in textbooks. It won't be mathematical, and according to the uh, sages, uh, this, can, this consciousness can only be experienced, and this is a singular, there is only a single consciousness, and in fact, uh, those of you who do history of science would uh, remember or would recognize that Schrodinger, one of the inventors of quantum mechanics, was inspired by this idea and he repeatedly spoke about how consciousness uh, ought to be looked at as a, as a singular, which is of course something that uh, has been uh, repeated by others as well. Now, another uh, interesting point here is uh, there, are, there is a binding between the outer and the inner, the macrocosm and the microcosm, which is why it is even possible to know because of binding. In Sanskrit, it's called bandhu. The other is paradox. In Sanskrit, it's paroksha, which is that because of this duality, the outer sciences cannot completely describe any situation where the observer is also a part. And therefore, all situations where observers are also a component or a part of would be associated with paradoxes. So there are all kinds of paradoxes that are described. And finally, there is transcendence because normally in our ordinary experience, we must structure whatever we have seen through language, through our internal discourse. And therefore, this creates its own paradox, because if we are governed by this internal discourse, how can we ever go beyond what this inner discourse tells us? And there, the whole idea is that there are these moments of epiphany or transcendence where you suddenly get transformed. You are not who you were before, and then you become a new self, which is the whole idea of self-transformation. And one of the other ideas related to this is that of recursion, that uh, the same structures repeat themselves at many, many different levels. And in fact, this is one of the most central things uh, that the Vedic uh, um, sages mentioned. And this was exemplified by this particular image of recursion as uh, being uh, a component of the whole solar system. And this is something that uh, the Vedic astronomers were able to discover. By, and all that you have to do is, if you take a pole of a certain height and move it 108 steps from you, you'll find that its angular size is the same as that of the sun or the moon. And this is, this is a, a fact that the sun is 108 times its diameter and the moon is about 108 times its own diameter away from the earth, which is why eclipses occur. And what is most astonishing is that the diameter of the sun is also approximately 108 times the diameter of the moon. Now, the significance of this is not the figure 108. The significance of this was to emphasize this connection between the macrocosm and the microcosm. And this connection was uh, emphasized by 108 names of the god or goddess of 108 beads in the rosary, 108 dance poses, 108 pilgrimages, 108 musical rhythms. Even the temple architecture had 108 as a component. And just as uh, those of you uh, who, who are, who've seen the image of the elephant god riding a rat, his, his uh, vehicle is a rat, and the whole idea is to take you to the whole incongruity of it so that you can go beyond the surface and try to see what is the deeper meaning. And here also the whole idea was, okay, these are 108. Can you sort of see what does it really reflect? And what it's supposed to reflect is the outer and the inner and the 108 beads uh, in the Japa Mala or the rosary was a kind of a symbolic journey from the earth, which is your body, to the inner sun, which is the lamp of consciousness. So, uh, so what we uh, see, and, and of course, this is the conception in the Gita, for example, that uh, the principle of consciousness is like the inverted tree. Normally, the standard scientific paradigm is that consciousness or various ideas emerge as a tree, and you have this diversity, but there it's an inverted tree. And 
just to conclude, uh, uh, the, uh, the yantra, which is um, often uh, associated with esoteric uh, practices in India, is this yantra called the Sri Yantra. It's an image. And what's this image? It's supposed to represent the inner cosmos or the outer cosmos. And you have all of these diagrams, these triangles, etc., which represent materiality. But in between these uh, 43 triangles that we have is supposed to be an invisible dot. And that represents consciousness. And the whole idea brings us back to the starting point that consciousness cannot be captured. It changes the world, and you might ask, how does it change if it's not even there? It changes by a principle which, in quantum mechanics, has uh, um, recently been explicated, and this is the so-called quantum Zeno effect. If you have a quantum mechanical system, any physical system, and you only observe it, just by the process of observation, you can steer the evolution of the system to whatever you want. You can either freeze it or you can change it to any desired state. And this is what was captured by the image, uh, and this is, of course, sort of frightening aesthetic uh, in certain parts of India, of the goddess dancing over the dead body of Shiva, because Shiva is not there to be found, since it sort of pervades Consciousness pervades the entire cosmos. With this, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.